Welcome everyone to the second morning uh, session. My name is Danica Fujimori. I'm at UCSF and I'll be chairing this session. And it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for this session, Dan Nomura from UC Berkeley. Uh, thanks. Wait, what do I? <laughs> okay, so I will try to make the 10 minute uh, schedule. Okay, so I have a lot of conflicts. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> So my lab is really, really interested in tackling the undruggable proteome, which Laura introduced beautifully earlier. I think this is still one of the biggest bottlenecks that we face in modern drug discovery, that over 90% of proteins are still considered undruggable because most proteins don't really possess well-defined binding pockets that a small molecule can bind to to affect their function. So very likely if you discover a colonial disease target, it's gonna be really difficult to drug it using classical drug discovery approaches. And these things include Proteins like protein complexes or intrinsically disordered proteins where it's really not clear where within these smooth interfaces or garbled messes like this you can identify binding pockets uh, they can pharmacologically interrogate. And in cancer, we're riddled with these. Um, and our premise is that, you know, if we can identify binding pockets or ligandable sites across all proteins in the proteome, that would really enable us to go after developing ligands or new therapeutic modalities against really any target or any disease indication that we want. And so to do this, we use covalent chemoproteomic strategies and we couple that with covalent small molecule ligand discovery approaches to both map ligandable sites directly in complex biological systems and also ligand those sites directly. Uh, we also are very much interested in this very hot space of targeted protein degradation that Laura introduced earlier, uh, where you can use small molecules to induce the proximity of E3 ligases with target proteins to ubiquitinate and destroy them. And so we've used covalent chemoproteomic approaches to expand upon the scope of targeted protein degradation platforms. And inducing the proximity of proteins to destroy them is just the tip of the iceberg of new induced proximity modalities that we can go after. And so I'll focus most of the story that I'll talk to you about, about today on developing new induced proximity-based therapeutic approaches beyond degradation, uh, all towards discovering new therapeutic targets and drugs. And so we do all of this by uh, screening our, our larger and larger library of cysteine reactive or lysine reactive covalent ligand libraries, and we can take these covalent ligand libraries and screen them in target-based and biochemical and phenotypic screens, and once we identify small molecule hits, we can then rapidly deconvolute the mechanism of action using kind of classical covalent chemoproteomic strategies developed by Ben Kravat and others uh, to be able to really rapidly deconvolute all the way down to the amino acid on which protein target or ligand bound to directly in a complex biological system, and also how selectively it bound to that site on a proteome-wide scale, so you can then subsequently really optimize your ligand with subsequent medicinal chemistry efforts to optimize potency and proteome-wide selectivity of your small molecule. And so we've used these strategies to really enable, for example, targeted protein degradation strategies and protax. Uh, this is an approach that was discovered originally by Craig Cruz and Ray Deshaies sitting in the audience here that uses these heterobifunctional molecules to induce the proximity of an E3 ligase with your target protein to ubiquitinate and destroy it. And this has become really popular to be able to now outright destroy disease-causing proteins, but one of the challenges in this field is that we have over 600 E3 ligases in the cell, but we only primarily use E3 ligase recruiters against two of these. One against cerebron with this thalidomide class of molecules, and another one is this peptidyl mimetic against VHL uh, that Craig Cruz developed. And it's becoming clear that these two E3 ligase recruiters are likely insufficient to be able to degrade any protein target of interest, and we need new E3 ligase recruiters. But these proteins are among the undruggable class of proteins, and so it's been really challenging to expand that arsenal of small molecules. But for example, we've now used covalent chemoproteomic strategies to really expand the scope of covalent E3 ligase recruiters that we can exploit in protax. So for example, we've discovered nimbolide and fully synthetic molecules that combine to RNF114 as a novel E3 ligase, uh, and we can, for example, degrade you know, targets like BRD4. We've also been able to discover RNF4 recruiters, as well as most recently, covalent FEM1B recruiters in collaboration with Mika Rapa's group to degrade neosubstrate proteins. And in fact, uh, you know, so we've been able to expand upon the scope, and, and we've in fact been able to identify ligandable sites across the vast majority of the over 600 E3 ligases. Uh, and so we can now systematically go after developing ligands against any of these E3s that we want for, for example, protec applications. But I think one of the really, really, you know, better ways to potentially go after degrading targets is using these monovalent molecular glues, which are much smaller in molecular weight, they're much more drug-like, um, and they can classically induce the proximity of two proteins that don't interact to confer some kind of neomorphic function. And in the degradation field, of course, estalidomide is a key example of a molecular glue degrader that can induce the proximity of cerebron with neosubstrates like sulfur and icarose to degrade them, 
And it was the SOL4 degradation effects that led to the birth defects in the 60s and the Icarus degradation that led to the uh, anti-cancer effects uh, from the Celgene BMS drugs. But uh, typically, you know, molecules like thalidomide have been accidentally discovered, and it's been thought that that's like a one in a billion type freak accident, and you're not gonna be able to like rationally design these things. Um, but in recent years, studies from Ben Ebert and Nico Toma uh, and in Eric Fisher's lab have shown uh, in accidental discoveries that making minor substitutions to otherwise regular inhibitors like roscovitine and this BI compound converted those into molecular glue degraders of those targets, indicating maybe there are rational chemical design strategies for converting protein targeting ligands into molecular glue degraders. And in fact, we've actually found one. Uh, I won't be able to talk about it. Hopefully we'll be uh, showing it very, very soon in the next like few weeks. Uh, so look out for this. This is uh, a project that was done by uh, Ethan Tariki, a very talented graduate student in our group that's sitting in the audience, and if you get him drunk enough, maybe he'll tell you something about it. Okay, but uh, what I wanted to spend the rest of this time on was actually enabling new therapeutic modalities outside of degradation. And so not every protein would benefit from degrading it, right? Some proteins you might want to stabilize it, in which case you want to develop a de-ubiquitinase recruiter, or for example, you might want to deacetylate it or dephosphorylate it, or demethylate proteins or DNA, right? Um, and so we've now been able to use covalent chemoproteomic strategies to now develop recruiters against really all of these. And today I'll talk to you about uh, this one approach of de ubiquitinase targeting chimeras or dubtax for targeted protein stabilization, which is essentially the opposite of protax. So there are a lot of disease-causing proteins that are aberrantly ubiquitinated and degraded to cause those diseases that you wouldn't want to degrade further. You'd want to de ubiquitinate and stabilize those targets. And the way to do that is by developing a de-ubiquitinase or dub recruiter and linking it onto a protein targeting ligand to induce the proximity of a dub to your ubiquitinated target to cleave off those ubiquitin chains to subsequently stabilize it. Now exploiting cysteine chemistry, which most of our covalent ligand library targets cysteines, is a little bit tricky because most dubs have a catalytic cysteine. And if you targeted the catalytic site, you would just have a dead dub and you couldn't recruit it anywhere, right? And so we wanted to look for dubs that had an allosteric, more reactive cysteine than the catalytic cysteine. And so we relied on our aggregate chemoproteomic database to look for uh, ligandable cysteines. Um, and all of the dubs, uh, not surprisingly, had a ligandable cysteine, of which, not surprisingly, most of those cysteines, the most reactive site was the catalytic site. You would expect that, right? But actually, a good third of the dubs actually possessed an allosteric, more reactive site uh, more reactive cysteine than the catalytic cysteine. And among those was this OTUB1 de uh, that's really expressed everywhere in every cell type at very high levels. Uh, and it's very promiscuous for its substrate scope, but it's very precise for removing K48 ubiquitin chains, which is the type of ubiquitin chains that destined proteins for degradation. And the most reactive cysteine in OTUB1 was this allosteric cysteine 23 versus the catalytic cysteine 91. So we thought we could selectively target that site. And so, we took recombinant OTUB1, we screened our covalent ligand library against it, we identified the sacrolamide EN523 uh, that was able to display cysteine reactive probe labeling against recombinant OTUB1. We showed by mass spec that this selectively only binds to that allosteric cysteine 23, which is interestingly uh, part of an intrinsically disordered region within this protein, and it does not bind to the catalytic cysteine 91. And consistent with that, when you reconstitute the activity of this enzyme looking at diubiquitin cleavage to monoubiquitin, uh, EM523 doesn't inhibit that activity, which is exactly what we want for recruiter. We have a silent recruiter. And so then we applied this to cystic fibrosis, where in cystic fibrosis, uh, this delta F508 CFTR mutation causes this protein to become destabilized and aberrantly ubiquitinated and degraded so that CFTR doesn't get trafficked up to the cell membrane, and that drives the cystic fibrosis pathology. Now, Vertex, one of the sponsors here, uh, developed this really beautiful chemical chaperone drug, Glumacaftor, that helps stabilize CFTR folding a little bit better so you get a little bit more of it trapped up to the cell membrane. But unfortunately, a large fraction of CFTR is still actively uh, ubiquitinated and degraded. And so we thought a dubtac could synergize with this approach. And so what we did was we took our OTUB1 recruiter, EM523, and we linked it onto the Vertex drug, Glumacaftor, and we treated these in epithelial cells, uh, lung bronchial epithelial cells expressing the CFTR mutation. And you could see that this compound was able to really radically stabilize CFTR protein levels in these cells compared to DMSO or even compared to the uh, approved drug, Lumacaftor. And this stabilization is, is OTUB1 dependent. If you knock down OTUB1, you attenuate that stabilization. And by quantitative proteomics, uh, we see quite selective uh, upregulation of CFTR protein levels. And we also see these other red dots. These are actually all heat shock proteins. We think that this is the cell's way of compensating for 
elevating the levels of this relatively unstable protein by also upregulating its protein chaperones alongside it. Uh, now, the question is, are we just elevating aggregated unstable protein levels, uh, or are we actually getting functional channel up to the cell surface? And uh, in collaboration with Novartis' respiratory group, we were in fact able to do uh, chloride channel electrophysiology studies, where I want you to focus on this middle part here, where in black are cells that have been treated with a channel opener, ibocaftor, so the chloride channel conductance goes up a little bit. In green are what patients are treated with, a combination of ibocaftor, postalumocaftor, so the uh, chloride ch channel conductance goes up a little bit more. And in blue is our dubtac plus ibocaftory. So you can actually see a substantial increase in improvement in chloride channel conductance, which means that we are actually getting a uh, stable, active, and functional chloride channel up to the cell surface. We've also been able to stabilize tumor suppressors as well. There are a lot of tumor suppressors that are aberrantly degraded uh, to cause cancer, and we were able to, for example, go after stabilizing WE1 kinase with a WE1 kinase inhibitor, linking it to our dub recruiters, and showing stabilization of WE1 kinase with these two compounds to the same extent as a proteome inhibitor like bortezomib. And so uh, with that, uh, we're really excited about this DubTAC approach. This is just the tip of the iceberg of other types of induced proximity modalities that can be enabled by chemoproteomic approaches. Uh, we've now recently started Vicinitas Therapeutics with the 65 million Series A in South San Francisco, and this company is actively recruiting chemical biologists. So this room is full of chemical biologists, so if you're looking for a job, please apply. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll stop and I'll, I'll thank my group uh, and also Novartis, which actually funded uh, the majority of this work. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Our next speaker is uh, Nathaniel Gray from Stanford. Great, so thanks for the invitation to come here. I'm gonna talk about um, kinase inhibitors and a program that we've been working on for uh, the last 20 uh, years. So really, um, the focus here is how do we extend the reach of kinase inhibitor therapy? I think everybody knows how successful kinase inhibitors have been as drugs, it's about 93 compounds approved. And the primary paradigm has been to go after oncogenically activated kinases like bcr able in CML or mutant EGFR in non-small cell uh, lung cancer. The major problem in the field is twofold now. One is that we sort of mined out the single oncogene dependencies in cancer. I, I think we pretty much uh, know which tumors are sensitive to monotherapy with a given uh, kinase inhibitor. And then problem number two is drug resistance. So you get often a very you know, durable response initially to the kinase inhibitor, but then eventually patients relapse with mutations that either block the drug binding or that activate a bypass uh, signaling pathway. So really, uh, this story all started with the discovery of the Philadelphia chromosome, which is this reciprocal translocation of um, chromosome 9 to 22 to lead to this mutant protein, uh, bcr able. So then uh, Sibagaygi and then later Novartis uh, developed the first uh, drug, Gleevec, right, which targets the ATP uh, binding site and fortuitously was also active against two other kinases, uh, CKIT and PDGFR, which allowed the kinase to work in other uh, tumors. As I mentioned, the major problem is drug resistance. And so here what happens is you typically will get mutations in the active site or elsewhere that impede uh, drug binding. Series of, of next generation drugs were developed that overcame those mutations, things like nilotinib, desatinib, and ponatinib. But we figured that we'd be able to find an alternate uh, strategy so we would be able to keep the kinase in a fully suppressed conformation. And so in a series of studies, we found a allosteric uh, binder uh, that basically binds in this meristic acid binding pocket that had been identified by John Curian and Julius Bertaferga as a merstilation site. And what this compound does is it binds here and induces the closed conformation of the kinase. And so essentially it recruits the SH2 domain and the SH3 domain onto the kinase domain to close the kinase and to keep it in an assembled uh, conformation. Here you can see that in more detail. Uh, compounds bind down here. They induce a kinking of this alpha I uh, helix. That allows a closure of the kinase and assembly of an inactive conformation. Then our, our co-workers uh, at Novartis continued this program to try to make more potent binders. So what they did was a fragment-based screen, and they found uh, these original uh, compounds. And interestingly, in this series, you can either find activators or inhibitors. Activators actually 
uh, push this helix into a linear conformation. Inhibitors make this L-shaped uh, conformation. So it's actually the first allosteric binding site on a kinase that can be, be both activating and inhibitory. And they ultimately ended up making this highly optimized compound called acisimib. Uh, Asisimib is a very potent uh, monotherapy inhibitor of BCR ABLE, but where it's going to be now deployed clinically is as a combination with the ATP site inhibitor. So instead of inhibiting uh, the kinase by simply binding in one binding pocket, you're locking down the kinase now by inhibiting in two uh, binding sites. And we're hoping now that this therapy is going to lead to a much more uh, durable uh, response. So based on that success, a number of years ago we thought, well, can we do it again for uh, EGFR? Right, so EGFR is a very uh, validated target, uh, and, and so in non-small cell lung cancer, if you present with either L858R mutation or exon 19 deletion, you'll get a first-generation EGFR inhibitor, uh, and typically what happens is you'll respond, but then you'll incur resistance due to mutation of the so-called uh, gatekeeper uh, mutation. And so when I joined the Farber in uh, 2006, I started working with two fantastic physician scientists, Pasiani and Kwok Wong, who encouraged us to figure out ways to overcome this T790M mutation uh, in EGFR. And so Wenjun in the lab developed a very nice uh, covalent probe that had this property of being able to selectively inhibit the T790M uh, mutation. We made these tool compounds, WZ4002. This inspired work by others, and a beautiful compound got developed by uh, AstraZeneca which targets the same cysteine in the front pocket, albeit from a different position uh, from this compound. And this compound actually had the added benefit of not only did it inhibit T790M, but it had a better therapeutic index for mutant EGFR over wild type EGFR, and was considerably better tolerated uh, than the first generation EGFR inhibitors. So we said, okay, now we're able to do that, but if you have a covalent inhibitor, you know you have a built-in Achilles heel, you know the cysteine mutation can arise. And so in collaboration with Mike Eck, we developed a allosteric EGFR inhibitor, and so we performed a high-throughput screen of EGFR at very high ATP concentrations. We found this initial compound, uh, EII001. Uh, we optimized it uh, to this compound. This compound wasn't sufficiently potent uh, to work against um, uh, fully uh, transformed cells that had a mutant EGFR. And so Jay Bong in the lab did further medicinal chemistry, optimized the, the binding affinity and the pharmacokinetics properties of this compound to make this JBJ compound, which again had very strong uh, monotherapy uh, activity. And actually we have a, a further development analog uh, that's in development at Dana-Farber, moving towards the clinic on this compound. And the exciting thing is that this compound again, like the BCR ABLE story, can be used in combination with an ATP site inhibitor. So again, we have two compounds uh, targeting uh, the kin kinase simultaneously. But we also thought, wouldn't it be good to have yet another modality as a second way to target EGFR? And we decided to make a bivalent degrader uh, from this compound. So we simply took the allosteric inhibitor, uh, made an imid-based uh, degrader, and sure enough, we can very nicely degrade uh, EGFR. And furthermore, because it can cobine with osimertinib, we can attack the kinase now in two ways, right? Covalently modify the ATP site by targeting the cysteine residue, and then allosterically using this binding pocket to degrade. And so the idea here is that we will have uh, more uh, challenge for the tumor to overcome uh, both of these uh, resistance mechanisms. So I don't have time to talk about it, but there's a third arm uh, of this strategy which requires targeting a transcriptional adaptation. And so typically what happens with kinase inhibitor therapy is the majority of the cells are killed, but then there's a small number of uh, cells which epigenetically uh, reprogram to survive the initial drug insult and live uh, in a dormant state for long enough that mutations can occur. And we're beginning to identify some of the transcriptional mechanisms there that will allow um, us to kill those dormant uh, tumor cells. So I think, uh, looking forward, we're really hopeful that we'll have targeted strategies that can be used in combination. Actually, I think it's a miraculous we're actually getting as much monotherapy activity from targeted inhibitors as we're getting, but we now need to get to a point where we can get multiple drugs on target uh, simultaneously. So I'll stop there and thank a really uh, fantastic group as well as all the industry collaborators we've had uh, over the years. Thank you, Nathaniel. Our next speaker is Jack Taunton of UCSF. Great. Thanks a lot, Danitza. Oh. 
First, I want to acknowledge the people who did this work. Uh, this is a new project in the lab, uh, unpublished work led by a great postdoc, uh, Ying Chen, uh, with indispensable contributions from another postdoc, Greg Craven. So the project is to identify, as Dan uh, beautifully introduced, new ligand binding sites throughout the proteome using the reactivity of nucleophilic side chains. And so Dan gave a nice introduction to show how this is uh, prominently done with cysteines. Uh, Dan's work and, and Ben Cravat's work uh, and, and Ken Su's work has also led to this idea that you can also go after new ligand binding sites by targeting lysine and tyrosine with different types of electrophiles. So how do we do this kind of chemoproteomic investigation? Uh, Dan touched on this, but this slide illustrates kind of the state of the art for going after tyrosines and lysines using a chemoproteomic approach. Usually this is done by screening large libraries of fragment-like electrophiles, as exemplified here on the right-hand side uh, of the slide for uh, reactive tyrosine groups, and on the left-hand side of the slide for reactive lysine groups. So these untagged uh, agents are added first, usually to uh, cell lysates at around 50 to 100 micromolar concentration, followed by kind of a universal simplified electrophile that is then tagged. So this is an indirect approach where you first try to decorate all of the reactive groups in the proteome, quantify and identify them by mass spectrometry, and then in a competition mode, look for the selective disappearance of certain sites by pre-blocking with your electrophilic library. So this is a very powerful approach, and it's allowed, especially within the cystinome, which is a bit smaller compared to the lysinome and the tyrosinome, the identification of many novel binding sites and reactive nucleophiles. However, the main challenge of this is that a typical mass spec chemoproteomic experiment can really get up to around maybe 10,000 sites in one run. Whereas when you look at the total number of reactive, of potentially reactive tyrosines and lysines, you'll see that now we're in the hundreds of thousands. So basically these approaches can really just scratch the surface of the possible uh, ligandable uh, nucleophiles in the cell. And so we wondered how we could address this with maybe a more direct approach. And recent work in our lab has come up with very tailored electrophilic probes to go after, in this case, on this slide shown, uh, reactive lysines. And these compounds are a little bit more structurally complex than the reactive fragments that are typically uh, employed. And they involve either electrophiles such as benzaldehydes or salicylaldehydes, or in the case of our HSP90 inhibitor here, a sulfonyl fluoride, in which a chiral center in the linker between between the key non-covalent recognition element and the electrophile itself was found to have an exquisitely powerful role in directing the kinetics of covalent bond formation. So we dovetailed off of this approach to come up with a new idea for now direct identification of covalently modified lysines and tyrosines uh, using somewhat more complex clickable probe libraries. And so the first generation library is shown here. Uh, there's a non-covalent recognition element, which is essentially the diversity element uh, shown on the right-hand side. So 10 different fragments of drug-like small molecules, mostly heteroaerial groups with different combinations of rotatable bonds and sp3 carbons. Then what's critical here is a chiral piperazine linker of both enantiomers. So we made a total of 20 different compounds, 10 pairs of enantiomers. On the other side of the piperazine, we see a linkage to a clickable aryl sulfonyl fluoride. So the idea here is now, instead of trying to do competition experiments, we're going to test both enantiomers of a pair in parallel and ask which enantiomer is able to most rapidly and effectively modify a given site. And so we'll use this enantioselectivity or an angioselective modification ratio as a proxy for a specific binding site and therefore the discovery of a novel ligandable site in the proteome. Moreover, we're going to do this in intact cells. So the overall uh, 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 mechanism for this or the overall workflow is shown here. We do this in triplicate, biological triplicate, for both members of the enantiomeric pair. We treat living cells with 10 micromolar of the electrophilic probe. We go through the typical chemoproteomic workflow. Now, each probe itself has a clickable handle, so we can pull out and identify the directly modified nucleophilic triptych peptide. 
We mix all the samples at the end of the day and use TMT labeling to uh, deconvolve the different channels and then use quantitative mass spectrometry, again, and this is the really challenging part, to identify triptych peptides, uh, for example, such as the one shown in the left-hand left side of the slide, containing the probe attached to directly the nucleophile of the target protein. And we use uh, TMT ratio uh, to basically quantify the enantioselective uh, modification ratio. And in this case, we're using an enantioselectivity factor of two to deem the protein ligandable. Um, so doing this, we find uh, hundreds and, and hundreds of sites, uh, about a third of which are specifically or enantioselectively modified by one enantiomer or the other. And just to go through like a small collection of these, we find many allosteric sites, many protein-protein interfaces and scaffolding proteins, and of course many uh, orthosteric or enzyme binding sites. And I just want to tell a quick vignette, and we see very nice probe selectivity with certain probes reacting with certain sites, others reacting with other sites, and different types of enantiomer selectivity, both favoring the S and the R enantiomer of the piperazine linker. So I want to give one example of a scaffolding protein called WDR5. Uh, WDR5 is an epigenetic regulator found in many multi-subunit protein complexes that contain lysine methyltransferases. Uh, also, very critically, WDR5 is a major mechanism for localizing the oncogenic transcription factor C-MYC to chromatin, and shown here is a crystal structure of C-MYC peptide bound to WDR5 at a distinct site from that which is bound to the methyltransferases, and you'll see that tyrosine-228, shown in yellow, is right at the bottom of this groove, and we identified this site as modified by preferentially a single enantiomer of this compound, too, with this uh, interesting benzimidazole uh, linked to a methoxybenzyl group. So in a validation experiment, Ng tests an overexpressed WDR5, whether this is really true that we see substantial labeling and enantioselective labeling by only uh, the R enantiomer, and sure enough, we see that. Moreover, uh, Ng found that when you mutate that tyrosine to phenylalanine, you see almost complete loss of covalent modification. Again, this is happening in intact cells. Granted, here it's with overexpressed protein, but obviously in the chemoproteomic experiment, we found this with endogenously expressed WDR5. So what about the potential functional consequence of this? Well, we were able to get a very high-resolution crystal structure of the covalently modified scaffolding protein, and sure enough, we see beautiful electron density for the covalent bond between tyrosine-228 and the aryl sulfonyl fluoride, now forming an aryl sulfonate. In addition, the rest of the molecule fits into this hydrophobic groove, which is occupied uh, precisely by the MYC peptide. Moreover, there are very specific hydrogen bonds between the piperazine amide carbonyl and both the serine uh, side chain as well as a backbone amide. And it's very obvious how this chiral center, this methyl group, which is predisposed to be in an axial conformation due to allylic strain, is able to discriminate between the S and the R enantiomers as that methyl group fits right nicely into a hydrophobic pocket. So in other functional experiments, Ng was able to show that modification of this site completely blocks the interaction of WDR5 with full-length MYC. So I just want to conclude by summarizing some of the main advantages of this approach. So now by designing libraries of directly clickable electrophiles, we can identify the direct targets and the modified nucleophiles. We have primarily tyrosines, but also a healthy number of uh, 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 interesting ligandable lysines in variety of proteins with different functions. Um, we've identified a total of 700 different sites. We find that this is not a superior approach to the competition indirect approach, but really a complementary approach. Uh, and in future work, we, fan to, we plan to expand the, the library and also further improve the chemoproteomic mass spectrometry technologies, uh, which were really key for getting this to work. It's not trivial to identify these peptides that are modified with such complicated hydrophobic drug-like elements. Uh, and with that, I'll close and move on to the next. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. Our uh, next speaker is Lei Wang of UCSF. Okay, can I have my first slide, please? All right. 
So um, we focus on studying biomolecular interactions. We primarily we consider proteins are the postdoctoral in the cell laboratory, and they interact with other postdoctoral biomolecules. And by chemical nature, those type of interactions are largely non-covalent and thus are often transient, relatively weak, and uh, reversible. Our goal is trying to engineer such non-covalent interactions into covalent interactions. Given how difficult to recruit a postdoc these days, imagine if you can convert a postdoc into permanent and uh, stable in your lab. And that's exactly what we want to do to proteins. We want to convert such interactions into strong, into irreversible, into a permanent interaction, to studying and researching and into utilizing biological activities. And our strategy is to incorporate an unnatural amino acid into the protein and enable such unnatural amino acid to react with the target residue. And we need to t fine tune the reactivity of the unnatural amino acid uh, to be re latent inside of the cell so that it does not react with any other molecules inside of the cell. And when the unnatural amino acid is brought close to the target residue, then the unnatural reactivity is triggered by the proximity effect and then forming a covalent bound specifically with the target residue. Using this uh, principle, our group and several other groups have designed and genetically incorporated a range of latent bioreactive unnatural amino acids into proteins. And using this unnatural amino acids, we are able to target a variety of natural residues as shown here in green. In particular, I want to highlight this unnatural amino acid, FSY, that contains the uh, fluorosulfonate function group, similar to the one that Jack just mentioned. And this unnatural amino acid is able to react with lysine, histidine, and tyrosine inside the cells. And we have been using this unnatural amino acid in multiple applications. In contrast to the huge success in covalent small molecule drugs, as you have heard in the prior talks, our ability to explore the covalent protein drugs remains largely underdeveloped. So we developed this technology, we call it proximity-enabled reactive therapeutics to create covalent protein drugs. The idea is quite straightforward. We put the latent unnatural amino acid into the protein drug. Upon the binding of the drug with the target, then the proximity-enabled uh, reactivity makes the unnatural react with the target residue and bound this covalent drug, uh, protein drug to the target irreversibly and stably. And we chose the immune checkpoint PD-1 and pd one as our initial test case. So pd one is a transmembrane receptor on the T cells, and pd one is the ligand of PD-1, often overexpressed on tumor cells. The interaction of the pd one with PD-1 and then inhibits T cell activity and the proliferation, resulting in T cell apoptosis and exhaustion in the tumor microenvironment. So if you can block this PD-1, pd one interaction, you can revive the anti-tumor immune response. And in fact, people have generated antibodies specifically either for the PD-1 or pd one to for cancer treatment. However, antibodies are large and they have a poor tissue or a tumor penetrance. In fact, uh, patients' response to existing PD-1, pd one antibodies also varies. Therefore, alternative strategies using smaller molecular uh, molecules uh, would be, uh, are being actively pursued. We envisioned we can put the FSY into the PD-1 extracellular domain and then generate a covalent binder of the pd one which irreversibly binds to the pd one on the tumor cells and effectively blocking the pd one to interact with PD-1 on the T cells. This would in turn enhance the T cell activity and to kill the tumor cells. In comparison, and the Y type one would dissociate from the pd one and have a less effective uh, uh, therapeutic uh, efficacy. So we made this PD-1 uh, FSY and to show that once you inject into the mice, xenograft with tumor expressing pd one 
And the Western blood analysis of the tumor tissue indicated that, as expected, the Y type PD1 did not cross link with PDL1, whereas our covalent PD1 FSY cross linked with PDL1 in a dose dependent manner. We then generate a human mice that has humanized uh, immune system, including human B cells, T cells, and dendritic cells. We xenografted the human lung cancer cell, H460, to form the tumor inside this uh, mice, and then inject uh, our protein therapeutics every four days. As you can see here, in the PBS control, the tumor grew rapidly, and the Y type of PD1 without uh, the unnatural amino acid did not slow down tumor growth significantly. In huge contrast, you can see here the covalent PD1 FSY significantly reduced the tumor uh, growth, and uh, 22 micrograms of PD1 FSY reached the same effect as the 200 micrograms at tizolizumab. This is the PDL1 specific antibody for cancer treatment approved by FDA. And if we increase the amount of PD1 FSY to the same mass amount, 200 micrograms, you can see this is significantly better than the antibody here. And the endpoint analysis also confirmed that the above trend. In blue here is the Y type PD1 did not show has slight increase of tumor uh, degradation of the, of the tumor weight. In red shown here is our covalent PD-1 FSY, which is dramatically better than the y type PD-1, and also the mean weight of the tumor is also significantly smaller than the one treated by the antibody. So, as you can see, the covalent PD-1 FSY show better therapeutic effect than the y type PD-1, and also a little better effect than the antibody. Tumor suppression is a relatively long process, on the order of days to weeks. We next tested whether this parallax strategy can also be effective in deal with acute process requiring prompt reaction. And specifically, we uh, attempted to generate covalent antibodies to inhibit the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So the idea is, um, when you have, um, uh, because the uh, cell entry of the SARS-CoV virus requires the interaction of the spike protein with the human ACE2 receptor. Therefore, many reagents have been generated to block the uh, spike interaction with ACE2. But if you think about it, if you have a non-covalent uh, binder binded to the spike protein, it will essentially, uh, eventually dissociate from the spike, and then the unblocked virus will regain access to the cell and infect the cell. So we thought it might be more effective to have an irreversible binder, a covalent nanobody, binded to this spike protein irreversibly. This might increase the potency of inhibition, and uh, in the meantime, minimize the viral escape through mutation. And we generated a covalent nanobody based on the uh, MMB6 published by uh, Peter Wright Group at UCSF. And we put the unnatural amino acid into this nanobody, and we show now the nanobody can covalent crosslink the spike RBD in 10 minutes. And uh, we incubated SARS-CoV-2 with our covalent nanobody using the Y type nanobody as a control, and then using this mixture to infect the, t uh, the human 293 T cells expressing ACE2 receptor. And after 72 hours, we then measured the luciferase activity to determine the level of infection. As you can see on the inhibition curve here, the Y-type MMB6 nanobody had showed an IC50 of 70 nanomolar, and our covalent nanobody had an IC50 of 1.7 nanomolar, suggesting a 71-fold increase of potency. We also tested the covalent nanobody in inhibiting other SARS-CoV-2 variants, and we, as shown in this table here, we see that all dramatically enhanced the potency of the Y-type nanobody in inhibiting the pseudovirus uh, infection. So, um, I hope I can uh, show, have shown you that through genetic encoding the latent bioreactive unnatural amino acids, we can convert the protein-protein interaction, the non-covalent ones, into a specific covalent linkages. In the meantime, uh, the ongoing work is we are trying to convert the rest of the biomolecule in interactions into the, uh, into the covalent linkages, and we have uh, some uh, promising results to show it's also possible to convert all this into stable and covalent linkages for, for studying biology and uh, develop uh, covalent therapeutics. And uh, I want to remind you that we do have a poster um, 
on um, Tuesday, tomorrow, uh, Bin Chen, who worked on this project, will tell you all the details if you're interested. Okay, and um, with that, I would like to thank my group and uh, thank the uh, wonderful collaborators and our funding, uh, uh, generous funding. Thank you. Thank you, Lei. Um, our next speaker for this session is Charlie Craig of UCSF. Let's go to the first slide. You now see the conclusions here. <clears throat> or do I just go back through? You can see what I'm going to be talking about. We can do it this way, too. <laughs> OK. So thanks to the organizers for including me. Uh, it's really been a pleasure. As Jim asked, I wanted to put this particular talk, which is a, a single story, into context of other things going on in the lab. And this is the one slide trying to do that. Three general areas that are actively going in the chemical biology area is long-standing interest in structure-based drug design, this conditional activation uh, for radio imaging and therapy, and confirmationally selective recombinant antibodies, which is what I'm going to be spending uh, the majority of the talk on for this one specific. But I wanted to highlight these because if you're interested, um, you might see the connection between this story and this story that I'll be talking about in the sense that we've gone after some of these irrever some of these challenging targets for viral infections, long-standing interest in the lab, and recently showed a nice proof of example with Adam Renslow's collaboration against CMV, and uh, a member of the herpetic uh, virus, viruses that are quite um, in the news lately because of their connection to multiple sclerosis and neurodegeneration and going after that irreversible inhibitor that trapped that enzyme that's common throughout the entire family, ca catching it in an um, inactive heterodimeric state is something that could show that going after a conserved cysteine outside the active site is a perfectly reasonable approach for uh, antivirals. This, this whole project has gotten booster uh, rockets added to it because it's now being applied to targets in current and future pandemic viruses through the AVID grant that Nevin Krogan is the PI on. Second project that's, that's quite active is uh, this conditional activation of, in this case, a sticky antimicrobial peptide. This is a, a nice collaboration with Mike Evans where we're doing this in terms of both radio imaging and for therapy. And then the confirmationally selective antibodies is something that's been quite active in the lab. And here's an example where we went after uh, the spike protein uh, with human naive uh, antibodies. So the project that's for the next uh, six minutes is one about KRAS, and this is the team just to make sure that uh, they're being recognized. Peter's here and giving a poster on this project for more specifics. Ziyang's at another meeting and he's over at UC Berkeley. He was a postdoc uh, with Kayvon. Uh, Ng is a new postdoc that's been working on the project, and of course Kayvon Shokat um, was uh, involved in this from, from the very beginning. So the general idea is, could we go after intracellular oncogenic targets with immunotherapy? And by taking advantage of a small molecule that is the hapten in this case that would diffuse across the membrane and target that oncogene could give you now selectivity um, for the tumor over uh, the normal cells, and if that labeled peptide could make it through the proteasome and through the MHC class one presentation pathway, in theory, it could be there that you could target it with an antibody. So it really married the chemical biology um, side of, of uh, Kayvon's lab with our antibody engineering <clears throat> was the original idea that Peter then took on as a graduate student. Now, we chose uh, KRAS because it's clearly uh, observed in a uh, number of cancers, about 20% of them. Uh, very prominent in lung and colon, as and it was mentioned previously. It's also in pancreatic, but it's rare there. <clears throat> but it's, when it's there, it's, it's a potential target. And then with the onset of the irreversible inhibitors that came up from um, 
Jonathan Ostrom, who's probably in the in in the audience here somewhere. That was his project nine years ago when his, they published it from Kavon's lab that generated ARS 1620, that initial tool compound that showed you could drug uh, KRAS, that GTPase, and trap it into an inactive state. So when we started this project, that was the only compound that we had available to us. Since that time, uh, Sotorasov has been approved and we've moved the technology onto that. So thanks, Ray for uh, helping make that happen. So the question was, could it be an actual tool that a haptan could target those, those tumor cells? That was the hypothesis. And why would you want to do that? Well, we realized, as has already been pointed out, if you have, particularly in, in uh, Nathaniel's talk, if you're going to have a, an inhibitor for cancer, there's going to be resistance that comes up. And this is a paper uh, that came out recently <clears throat> from Ryan Corcoran's lab where they looked at the sotorasib in these particular patients, and this is one patient that if you look, this is transaxial imaging view, and this is uh, uh, basically an, a, a lymph node in the armpit that's right there, and you can see it, and after four weeks of treatment, it's resolved, all right? It's a very nice treatment, but then after four months, it's starting to come back. And then they show in that paper that both um, innate and acquired resistance that comes up against the KRAS inhibitor, the sotorasib, usually maintains one allele at least of the KRAS G12C. So if you could now bring immunotherapy to boost up the activity and salvage that initial effect, that was where we wanted to go. So you needed an antibody, so we turned to our platform, identified a highly selective antibody against, in this case, a peptide that was predicted to bind to one of the alleles. It's quite common <clears throat> on the MHC complex. And with that cysteine that's now labeled with ARS-1620, could we get an antibody that recognizes it? And we have one here that's in the, the double-digit nanomolar range. It's from a human naive library, so it's basically um, prepped to go into uh, clinical trials as we develop it, if this concept is going to be possible. And it's highly selective now for that haptonized peptide as that new neoantigen. We did the crystal structure of it because we wanted to see how it actually worked, and it finds this nice little pocket in between the heavy and light chains uh, between those CDRs, and you see it just wraps around um, the, the ring structures and sticks that acrylamide out on the surface where that peptide, where we did the initial panning, uh, was, was, uh, which Peter used for the original panning. Now, it's quite selective because if you just take this arrow group and you look at the different uh, isomers on it, it's unique to that of the, in this case, ARS-1620. It doesn't touch that other um, atrope isomer. So we have a very specific antibody to that haptonized peptide. Does it actually make it out onto the surface? And so you can build it into a, an IgG and you can do a Western, and this is now on cells, in this case either uh, lung cancer cells, pancreatic cancer cells, or a highly resistant lung cancer cell, or the wild type. And you do the Western, and you can see you, you, that our antibody, which in this case is P1A4, is picking it up. And then you use immunological um, antibodies as well to see whether the MHC complexes are there, and they're indeed there. And then Ziyang, as he, when he was a postdoc, came up with this idea, well, how do we really show it's out there on the surface? We use proximity ligation uh, assay, where you take our P1A4 antibody that's going to be recognizing that haptonized peptide in the MHC complex, take an antibody that's known to be um, specific to the heavy chain, and then have those oligos, and the only way you're going to see a signal now is if they're close to one another. So you go into that lung cancer cell line, that, that pancreatic cancer cell line, or this resistant ones, and you can see where there's red, you're getting that imaging, um, that proximity is there. So presumably the peptide is available on the surface. Now, this one looks like it's weak, but if you look at the actual puncta as one of the reviewers of this paper uh, that recently came out two weeks ago showed, actually the puncta are higher in this pancreatic cell line than in these others. So there's some really interesting biology that we'd, uh, we'd like to probe. Oh, and of course, the control is there that when you go into the cell line, that has KRAS there, um, but it's the wild type, you're not getting recognition. 
So all that looks good. So does it actually work if you then try and bring immunotherapy to this intracellular target that's been displayed out on MHC? So we built a bite and did this particular experiment for proof of principle against that, um, that uh, lung cancer cell line that's highly resistant. So dose it for four hours, come in with uh, peripheral blood mononuclear site cells, and then our antibody that's built into a bite where half of it is interacting with P1A4 to recognize those tumor cells, the other half is targeting CD3. And you can see now in this uh, graph right here, when you're dosing it under concentrations of ARS 1620, where it's suboptimal, right? It's not killing all of the cells, but now you come in with the bite, you can see that diminution of the activity and you can follow that and quantitate it with, uh, with, with facts as well. What about resistance? So build that same cell line now with the G12V, which could be one of the variants. How many minutes was that? That's zero, okay. Um, so, thanks, Wenji. Uh, so get a similar type of effect. You get that uh, additional impact when you have that immunotherapy. So the concept seems to, be, uh, seem to be possible. The liability of this initial antibody was big, it, that it bound to, it was specific. You saw it's highly specific to the tool compound. So could we get one that's more specific to the MHC complex? So you saw this slide already, so you had a chance to, to ingest it. You see how similar Sotorasiv is to ARS-1620, but our antibody didn't recognize it, so we did a new campaign, did it with MHC complexes, and you can see in this case, this one over here is about 300-fold greater specific for the MHC complex now, so we don't have that liability, so we're on to doing uh, the, animal, uh, the animal trials. So this is the kind of the conclusion and where we're going with this, and that is we, we have this crank where we're going for better and better antibodies uh, that can do the kinds of things we want to do. As I said, these are coming from human live, uh, naive libraries. We then do the uh, characterization of those in terms of their cross-reactivity, the structure of it, and then the competition with the free drug. We're headed into the preclinical testing. It's a really nice collaboration with Mike Evans using the radiotherapy for that second project I showed you on that first slide but also more recently on the CAR-Ts with Carl June and Joe Frietta at uh, Penn, at University of Pennsylvania. And then we're, we're testing that in both um, cell and animal models. And then our clinical testing is really empowered with Pamela Munster, who is uh, from the Cancer Center working with us on this, uh, getting access to patient samples along with Colin Blakely, who's a, a lung doc that's working with us. And of course, we're trying to get resources to go forward with the clinical trial. And so just to summarize, these are the folks again um, and some of the other people who helped. If they're starred, they're no longer uh, working with us. They've got their own jobs elsewhere. Daniel Green, uh, we've brought on, and thanks so much to Barry Selleck for the Invent Fund that really helped support this. And Daniel's helping raise some funds to get the clinical trial up and running through HAP10 Bio. So just like all of us, we're all recruiting both for the lab on the academic side and for the company side. <clears throat> And then I, I referred to these collaborators as well, and um, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Our final speaker for this session is Kevin Shokat of UCSF. Audience, please keep your questions coming in, and we will uh, um, uh, have them uh, uh, presented to speakers panel after Kevin's talk. Thank you, Denitza. Thanks, everybody, and uh, it's been, it's, thank you for everybody who worked so hard to organize, and it's great to see everybody here in a room together. So um, I switched the topic to talk about uh, a different project since the title of the talk, uh, the, those couple papers just came out recently, and I'll be talking about reactivating the tumor suppressor P53. Um, the most relevant disclosure here is for nested therapeutics. So, Charlie um, told us about um, uh, the importance of KRAS. It's the most frequently mutated oncogene across cancer uh, and, and the different small molecule as well as antibodies um, that are able to, to target those tumors. Uh, and it's been fantastic to see the first approved direct KRAS inhibitor from Amgen uh, just last year. So I think a lot of excitement on the KRAS side. Well, really, the, 
also important flip side of cancer are the tumor suppressors. And the most frequently mutated gene across all cancer is P53, the so-called guardian of the genome. And to give you an idea about the number of patients that have these two lesions, um, across the world, there are 18 million new cancer patients. About 2.5 million of them will have a KRAS mutant, uh, and about 9 million of them will have some sort of aberration on the P53 gene. So these are the real uh, dominant genes to be concerned about with the majority of cancer. Um, and P53 is a, is a transcription factor, something we don't usually think of uh, as chemically tractable and things like that. So, um, we, we know that uh, many, many pioneering studies and the interactions between KRAS and P53 were done in genetically engineered mouse models from Tyler Jacks and Dave Tuvison. And, and I think this early paper really highlights the magnitude of the effect of perturbing P53 or KRAS or the two of them together. So if you knock out one copy of P53, you have some uh, mild loss of, of survival uh, in, in mice. If you take out that second copy, you have a dramatically uh, shortened lifespan for these mice, uh, tumor-prone, uh, very, very severe phenotype. That one uh, swing from the yellow to the green is, is really a, a dramatic result. If you just mutate KRAS, leave both copies of P53 intact, you have that sort of intermediate phenotype. So as a single lesion, it is a very severe uh, um, uh, predictor uh, of lifespan. And then if you combine loss of one copy of P53, uh, you have a more severe phenotype. And then of course, you might predict that the, the most severe is losing both copies of P53 and gaining uh, um, a KRAS allele. So as we start to think about the therapies that are entering the clinic, we can sort of take these curves and go in reverse. So right now, we're seeing KRAS therapies come through. We're seeing some uh, very, very significant uh, uh, patient benefit, but there's a lot of room for improvement. That's why Charlie described the uh, um, sort of combination of a direct KRAS inhibitor plus an antibody therapy that could recruit T cells to kill those cells. What we'd really love is to reverse the P53 loss of function and get all the way back up uh, to normal life. And that, that would be uh, really transformative. So we're working on many, many aspects of doing that. You might think that we don't usually reactivate tumor suppressors, and maybe that isn't a very good modality. But uh, this uh, study early on showed that when you make tumors that have uh, no P53 function, um, and then you turn on with the doxorubicin uh, inducible system P53 function for just a few days and then turn it back off. So just a pulse of reactivating a tumor suppressor, you can see that the tumor continues to, uh, to shrink and disappear. So the magnitude of effect, biological effect we could get from reactivating a tumor suppressor is in many cases more dramatic than we can get than inhibiting the oncogene. Well, the challenge of doing that is that if you think about how tumor suppressors are lost, you could imagine that they are deleting the whole gene, stop codons. There are numerous ways to inactivate a gene. Um, and so how do you think about chemically reactivating P53 if the gene and the protein uh, are lost? There's nothing to bind to. That's the uh, most extreme of the undruggable. There's just nothing to drug. So how does that, how does that really work? Well, P53 is an outlier, not only being the most frequently mutated gene across all cancer, but among the tumor suppressors, it's an outlier for the kinds of mutations that appear recurrently in the patients. So the big parts of these, uh, so the, the, the common tumor suppressors are across the top, P53, APC, ATM, uh, BRCA1. The slice of the pie that we're most interested in are, is the green, the missense mutation, where we convert one amino acid into another amino acid. And you see that the slice of the P53 pie for missense mutations is 75%, compared to uh, you know, a 4% in APC, where that's not a very common kind of lesion. So if there are missense mutations, 
then you would hope that they would also be recurrent because if we come up with a chemical strategy to target one of them, you'd like that one to be a reasonable fraction. And that's another special feature of P53 lesions. You get two classes of mutations, those that are at the DNA uh, binding interface and those that are scattered throughout the protein and are stability mutants. And while we would love to be able to rescue loss of binding here, sort of like Dan introduced a molecular glue that would bring P53 to all of its uh, uh, target genes, that's something we haven't even really tried to do yet. We think that's quite hard to do. But this Y220C mutation is a structural mutation and it provided a cysteine, which of course, as we all know, made a very nice uh, chemically tractable approach. So our goal is to find a small molecule that rescues the Y220C mutant covalently and then uh, reconstitutes DNA binding activity. So um, we were very fortunate. Alan First Lab had done a lot of chemical screens, NMR screens, small molecule screens, computational screens, to identify this carbazole species that bound in the Y220C pocket. So Keelan in the lab designed an acrylamide that hung off this uh, carbazole to try to covalently hit that molecule. And that first molecule he made, uh, in fact, covalently labeled Y220C mutant. And then the shift assay with the click camera showed very good engagement. And he solved the crystal structure of it bound compared to the lead molecule that we had, the reversible ligand. Uh, and you can see the covalent bond is made. It flipped the molecule around and made new interactions that were not present and identified as highlighting important SAR elements from the first ligands. And so Keelan uh, set about to really optimize this. The carbazole turned out to be a little bit too reactive, so we uh, chewed off one of the rings, made a number of other substitutions to give us vectors off of uh, this indole and introduced a nitrogen late in the process. Uh, and then a lot of the key optimizations turned out to be off of this four position. Uh, and you can see that this is the thermal stability rescue of the Y220C. So wild type is about eight degrees more stable than the Y220C. Many of our early ligands stabilized just one or two degrees, but finally uh, with the right uh, um, sort of arms on this molecule, we were able to stabilize back up to wild type. Uh, that just shown there. Uh, and then Keelan's structure showed uh, something I wanted to highlight. You can see, of course, the cysteine bond, but really this is where the tyrosine was in the wild type protein. Now taking out that phenol, uh, the phenol, what did we have to do to rescue uh, the thermal stability? Uh, we had to really reach out and make a prosthetic, essentially, that will reach, and what we found was a very new interaction with the distal aspartate 228 in one of the loops. And this modified the conformation somewhat different than other wild-type P53 structures. So to rescue that defective mutant, we had to sort of do something new to the protein. And then in the last data slide, um, in a syngenaic model where we have the parent cells, which are P53 wild type, or where we introduce Y220C, we use Nutlin, the E3 inhibitor, uh, as a positive control. We can rescue the wild type function uh, a little bit in the Y220C. Our compound does nothing in the wild type, but uh, dramatically increases uh, transcriptional activity. And these are the patient-derived cells, uh, both uh, two models of Y220C and one of wild type. And you can see that our compounds do uh, the expected transcriptional activation and Nutlin has no activity when you have a P53 mutant. So um, with that, we're continuing to modify and improve uh, that ligand. Uh, and I just um, thank everybody for your attention uh, and then tell you that this was a project done by a fantastic postdoc in the lab, Keelan, who's here today, uh, but unfortunately has just left the lab. So um, thank you very, very much uh, for your attention. Thank you to all the speakers. Could we have you back on the stage? Thank you. Terrific, really inspiring session. Thank you all. It was wonderful to see application of covalent um, inhibitory modalities from small molecules through proteins, through applica application to immunotherapies, correction of oncogenic mutants. So, um, truly inspiring. We have uh, quite a few questions from the audience that 
Um, and I'll select those that, that uh, uh, people have uh, uh, voted up. So uh, first, uh, one will be for Dan, and um, the question is uh, on the advantages of covalent small molecule ligands compared to nanobodies, um, um, and in general, addressing the toxicity of covalent inhibition. Yeah, so uh, the huge advantage of a completely small molecule-based approach is obviously it's more drug-like properties and being able to make it orally bioavailable, which I think would be pretty challenging with a, a nanobody. Um, and then in terms of the selectivity of covalent molecules, I think one of the reasons why there's been a resurgence in covalent drug discovery is that we can really de-risk these molecules with chemoproteomics and really ensure that the molecules we make are highly selective, and if they're not, we have a snapshot of what that selectivity profile looks like and couple, couple that with MedChem to make the molecules more selective. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Dan, for that. Um, Jack, the next question is for you, and it deals with uh, 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 abundance of lysins and tyrosines uh, you know, on surface proteins as well as mass spec challenges in identifying um, surface, labeled surface proteins from proteomic experiments. Yeah, so uh, I guess one of the huge challenges is that both lysine and tyrosine are incredibly abundant. Um, they're often on the surface of proteins, and they're incredibly reactive. Uh, and so one of the main challenges in using direct approaches um, and indirect approaches is that you'll see just tons of labeling of these sites in a fairly nonspecific way uh, by especially rather simple probes, including the probes that we developed. Uh, and so the critical aspect of this is, is basically how to filter out this kind of low level of background uh, uh, modification. And, and what's comforting, though, is that although the signal, uh, or in this case it's the noise, tends to be rather strong, uh, the actual stoichiometry of labeling of these uh, surface sites is quite low. Um, and so as, as long as we have very high resolution uh, mass spectrometry methods uh, that can deconvolve this huge complexity, um, we're able to kind of sift through uh, these commonly modified sites and really pick out uh, the winners, the gems that are specifically modified by unique probes, and especially as, as we've shown in this talk, uh, in an enantioselective fashion. Thank you. Uh, Nathaniel, the next question is for you. You already addressed mutations of the cysteines as the major um, mode of uh, uh, resistance. You've also uh, touched on transcriptional ad adaptation mechanisms. Could you elaborate a bit on what you see as major challenges um, to, to covalent therapies? Yeah, no. So certainly, yeah, mutation is, is the you know the first thing that happens, uh, and that and that can take a while. So if you have ways of of slowing down that adaptation, you know that that's key. And it's very clear that you have to have the immune system uh, on your on your side as well. So uh, really finding the way to get you know target therapy and immunotherapy to work in a in a complementary fashion, I, I see that as sort of being the frontier. Thank you. Um, Lay, you, you uh, described incorporation of unnatural amino acids as a way to develop covalent protein therapeutics. And we have a question uh, as of uh, what in your mind are uh, key limitations of those and um, um, is there uh, 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 potential problems that you envision with uh, serum proteins uh, cross-linking to some of the reactive electrophiles? Um. Uh, I'm sorry, the second part of the question is? Uh, uh, serum proteins and reactive electrophiles. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, that's actually um, one of the um, problems we are working on, but we haven't found a solution yet. So we initially thought, um, based on many papers published by Jeff Kelly, Barry Sharpless, the uh, fluorosulfonate should be able to cover and talk to serine, threonine, and those type of... Uh, and nucleophiles, but in our case, we found if you put it as an unnatural amino acid, it forms the covalent linkage, but it's hydrolyzed, and it converts serine to a DHA, the hydroalanine. So it's, it, so far, we haven't have, we don't have uh, an unnatural amino acid to talk to serine successfully. But if you have good ideas, I'll be happy to collaborate with you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you, Lee. Uh, Charlie, you beautifully described the development of an immunotherapy against an intracellular protein by um, uh, using covalent uh, reactivity and uh, um, uh, surface displays. So 
question that, that uh, uh, has been of interest to the audience a lot is, um, how do you compare this approach um, relative to immunization with haptonized care as uh, patients develop their own antibodies? Um, I, I think that's a, that's a perfectly reasonable approach. Um, I, I think what's happened in this case is having that handle on there and sending it through that pathway and having the antibody already engaged and ready to go and shovel ready and going to be, um, I think, a better shot on goal than whether you could get uh, the jackpot effect <laughs> of getting that right antibody through natural immunization, you're going to be playing uh, it against one another. I'd, I'd say if you want to make a drug, I think having that one ready to go is we could get there sooner. But I love the idea of immunization. So it's something that we're kicking around in terms of can we, can, would it be faster? And how does that compare? How often will you get it com compared to just the approach of make the drug and go in and go after it? Um, and Kevin, the final question is for you. Great to see the rescue strategy of why to see mutant. It's not clear to me why does it impact binding to DNA? being on the very opposite side of the DNA recognition of P53. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't explain it well, but that's an unfolded protein, really, with that uh, tyrosine to cysteine mutant. So it's just in a sort of unfolded state. And so when we put the molecule there, and I should have said there's it a... stabilizes a, the protein. That's where you see the TM shift. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And there's a molecule in the clinic from PMV Pharma that does that non-covalently. So there's multiple people have looked at that. Got it. Thank you. Well. Let's thank again all the speakers for a terrific session.